We grow when we give. We grow when we give. We grow when we give. Nosotros crecemos cuando damos. We grow when we give. We grow when we give. Welcome to ROG, Return on Generosity. I'm your host, Shannon Cassidy. This podcast celebrates generosity at work, not financial giving. Giving valuable time, mutual respect, alternative perspectives, and genuine collaboration. Our special guest today is Tiffany Yu, CEO and founder of Diversibility. She's a social impact entrepreneur, content creator, disability advocate, and a three-time TEDx speaker. She also serves on the San Francisco Mayor's Disability Council. She's a speaker, ally, podcast host, and you can find her on Wikipedia. What I appreciate most about you, Tiffany, is your commitment to increase intersectional disability representation and to nurture disability inclusion. Welcome to ROG, Tiffany. Yeah, thanks for having me, Shannon. I'm grateful that you're joining us, and I really look forward to learning from you. So could you please share your origin stories and background with us? Sure. So I am the youngest daughter, first generation, of a Taiwanese immigrant and a refugee from the Vietnam War. And I grew up in a suburbia right outside of D.C. And the biggest turning point for me, which I see as my origin story of why I do the work that I do today, is at the age of nine over Thanksgiving weekend, I was involved in a car accident where I acquired a slew of injuries, including a couple uh, disabilities, and my dad also passed away. And so the reason why I wanted to mention that is because I call this like multi-layered grief. Uh, It's the standard grief that most of us understand of losing a loved one, my dad. It's the grief, disability grief, of seeing changes happen in my body. Uh, I I paralyzed one of my arms and much, much later I'd be diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder related to the accident. And a third layer of grief, which is the loss of childhood innocence. Um, And to be totally honest, I think that that third layer of grief is something I wish more of us talked about. Like, can't we just let kids be kids? But I digress. So so that's my origin story. And and for 12 years, I didn't tell anyone about the car accident. Uh, Being the daughter of Asian immigrants, my mom said something to me. She said, I don't want anyone to know about our struggle. Now it all makes sense. She actually said that, she said that to me over Thanksgiving. And it made sense why she told everyone that my dad was away on a trip. So I told everyone that my dad was away on a trip. I never told anyone about the car accident. And I wore long sleeves all the time to try and quote unquote hide my disability. And yeah, it wasn't until 12 years later, I was a senior in college, had done this internship on Wall Street, where I was kind of getting really curious about I have this story that no one has validated, um, that I haven't even validated for myself. I never thought that it mattered, that now I'm wondering if I can find a community of other people who have gone through those experiences or feel shame about their sheer existence because of external messages that we're receiving and start to unlearn that. Oh my goodness, thank you for sharing that. There's so much in there. And I just really appreciate your willingness to share that so we can understand some of what's brought you to the place you are now and to appreciate some of the lived experiences. And, you know, you've talked about this as your origin story, and I've heard it said that we sometimes have multiple origin stories. So would you agree that you had the origin story of how that happened when you were a nine-year-old child and then the origin story of when you decided that this was a topic that you wanted to speak about? Yeah. So the one thing I want to preface before we go into origin stories is that we don't owe anyone our story. I think Brene Brown has this really great quote when she's like, when you meet someone, you have to ask yourself, has this person earned the right or the privilege to hear my story? And so so that's that's kind of like the little asterisk on it. But I really believe in the power of stories to create intimacy, to create understanding and allyship. So I often talk about how we have two disability origin stories. The first is uh, at probably the, the more uninteresting one to me is just that story of, of, of disability. Um, some people have a diagnosis, some people don't due to the medical system. There's that first one. But then the second one, which for me happened that 12 years later, which is when we decided to take ownership and pride and maybe just acceptance of a disability identity because we can't always feel proud. 
So, so I actually think that second story is more important. And a lot of the work that I do is, I know that a lot of disabled people may not get to that second story, but through community, through a collective, through seeing other people, can we empower other folks within our community to get to that second story? Oh, thank you for sharing that. And so as leaders, like you're saying, not like nobody owes you their origin story, but what are some ways that you have found that people create environments where people with disabilities would be willing or open to sharing their stories? Like what, what role does the leader play in creating a safe place and really an encouraging place, an inclusive place for all people? Yeah, I, I think I think it really, I mean, you mentioned the word safe. I think it really comes down to psychological safety. But for me, the reason why I lead with that story is by leading by example, I have found so many other people share things with me that they hadn't shared with anyone else. And so one of the interesting things is I I get invited every once in a while uh, with some of our corporate partners to come in and give like a presentation around disability and allyship. And I often open with those two origin stories and the number of people who come into the chat uh, on the Zoom, either messaging me personally or just sharing their own experience with disability or their connection to it, I see that as a catalyst for conversation. So why did it have to be that you had to bring in Tiffany externally to start that conversation? How can we have our leaders lead with more vulnerability? A lot of leaders actually don't because they fear that they will be that their credibility will be threatened and that their capabilities will also be threatened. And that just makes me sad, right? It's kind of this this cycle of, you know that there are benefits when you are open and, you know, we call it like your authentic self or like unapologetically yourself. And you model that for everyone who is looking at you, but there's this fear of, am I going to be judged? When I got diagnosed with PTSD in 2019, I actually felt a little bit of relief because I knew that the way that I was reacting and and how unsafe, how easily unsafe I felt in any environment was due to something else. And because I had that diagnosis, then I could get the treatment. But someone asked me, they said, I wish if if I could go, I of course wouldn't change anything because all of my life experiences have made me who I am today. But if I could change one thing, I wish it was that someone could see that at nine years old, that was not something that any nine-year-old should go through. And I wish someone had like forced me into therapy or something because it would have helped me because what the way that PTSD becomes worse is when you try and suppress hard emotions. You don't let your body complete the stress response cycle and my body had gone through something, I don't know if I would call it stress, something very traumatic that I didn't have a processing, that I didn't know how to process in a healthy way. Yeah, well, thank God you're confronting that now and you're really not only working through that yourself, but the way that you're inviting us into learning through your experiences and encouraging people to have that same, you know, or for you're encouraging people to heal. So Tiffany, there's a lot in what you just shared One of them is when you were speaking about creating those safe spaces to open up these conversations and the ways in which I've heard you do it. Um, How do you recommend that we have these kinds of conversations? It's a really hard question. Again, we can't force, we can't force anyone to share their story, right? And so one of the things I've been thinking a lot about, so I had, I had been talking about this thing called inspiration porn, which is when we look at someone who's disabled for doing everyday tasks and think that they're so inspiring for just existing. But there's a difference between inspiration porn and inspiration. Because if I look at the story of this nine-year-old girl and who I am today, I think that's inspiring. And so I wanted to translate that over to curiosity. So I I made up this term curiosity porn. But the reason why I wanted to bring it up is, are you asking for someone's story because of curiosity porn? Like the questions that a lot of disabled people get, a lot of them are very intrusive, right? So we don't owe telling anyone what our disability is. In the workplace, the question should be more framed around what access needs do you have in order to thrive in this environment? versus what is your disability, right? And what is your disability and prove it? So I would say the what is your disability and prove it is more of a curiosity porn type of thing, but a what do you need to thrive in this environment is more curiosity. And, and curiosity creates connection and curiosity porn creates a disconnection. 
because it's saying, whoa, you're so different. I'm like, curi- yeah, I'm like curious. It's exotic. You know, it's, it's so different. So um, I, I don't know if I explained that clearly, but, but that's just something that's been coming up for me because I think that a lot of people are curious about the disability experience because in the U.S., you know, three-fourths of folks don't have disabilities. I guess, again, it's coming back to that distinction of just approach any person that you meet. And this is for leaders, like approach your relationships with curiosity uh, because curiosity leads to intimacy and connection and people feeling safe, right? But then another part of it is also leading by example. So if you're a leader or a manager, can you also, you know, this pandemic is hard for everybody in one way or another, can you share a little bit more about that or just do a check-in at your beginning at the beginning of the meeting and let people express whatever they need to express? Absolutely. And I know your experience at Goldman Sachs helped you to see that in real time, right? Where you saw the leaders of this company at the time that you were contributing there who had their own disabilities and you're seeing like that look how successful they are or using them as a role model. Like you're saying, lead by example, share your story. I would love more disabled people to have experiences like that in corporate spaces. But a lot of times we're not even given the chance because people are making assumptions about what they think we can or can't do. When we come back, Tiffany will share her thoughts and advice for companies who are activated to improve inclusion and belonging for people with disabilities. With years of experience, Moz Travels is a complete disability services consulting firm. We specialize in accessible travel and tourism. Working with governments, hoteliers and businesses, ministries of tourism and travel destinations around the world, we conduct accessibility compliance audits to ensure your place of business is accessible and inclusive for everyone. We'll teach you how to increase your tourism revenues and we'll train your staff how to recruit, hire and communicate with people who have a disability. Contact us at www.moztravels.com. That's M-A-A-H-S travels.com. And we're back with more from Tiffany Yu, CEO and founder of Diversability. What are some of the practical, actual things that you think companies can do to help to change those statistics? Yeah, I would say, so three things just popped to my mind, but I also just want to credit an Accenture report that came out in 2020 that talked about how about 76 to 80% of disabled employees and leaders aren't transparent about their disabilities at work. And so what that report ends up doing is it walks through, I think, eight strategies for how to build a more disability-inclusive culture, aka psychological safety for disabled folks. But I will share the three things that came to mind. And the first is that there is another research report that came out that surveyed hiring managers as to why they weren't hiring disabled folks. And uh, the top reason was that the hiring managers weren't sure what the person, the candidate with a disability could or couldn't do, right? So just think about how much assumption is in there. So the way you combat that assumption is by letting disabled people show you what we can do, right? It sounds so easy, but we have so many biases. So the thing is like, I can't use one of my arms. And Shannon, you follow me on TikTok. So I've got some content on there showing people how I do things with one arm. I did have to relearn how to write with my left hand and that that was a little bit that was a little bit more of a learning curve. So that's point number 1. Point number 2 is just the power of the disability employee resource group. So I oftentimes, you know, we didn't talk that much about diversity, but I often describe us as a disability employee resource group or affinity group that exists outside of a company. Part of my pitch at Goldman was that they had a group called the Disability Interest Forum. And during my recruitment process, I got to meet the leads of that group. And I actually think that they were very supportive of my whole recruitment process. And then when I worked at the bank, I would participate in their programming. And then when I moved to Bloomberg, I noticed they didn't have a disability ERG. So employee resource group is ERG. So I co-founded it. And the number of other Bloomberg employees who had been there for many, many years and had never, you know, been in community with other disabled employees, like I just saw them shine. So that was number two is the is the ERG. And then the third for me is one of the things I've become really interested in is when we talk about hiring managers, we assume they're non-disabled. 
And uh, the reason why I bring that up is not only is it getting in the door and having a community there while you're there, but I want to be able to have a pathway to promotion and leadership because I think it's so interesting, so many of the conversations that we have now when we're like, okay, what can hiring managers do or what can recruiters do? And we assume that the hiring manager or recruiter is non-disabled, right? How can we flip the script and say, what can all of us do? Because because I was actually, my last year at Goldman, I was a recruiter and I hadn't really like owned you know, all of this disability work that I do, but I wanted to increase pipeline for women, for people of color, uh, even for disabled folks too. Uh, And I wanted to better understand what that process looked like. And sometimes they were like, Tiffany, why did you shake with your left hand? Was that a test? Which I thought was like kind of funny, but yeah, it was almost like as the front, the frontline person of the recruitment process, like here is already a celebration of difference. Another part of the reason why I am open about my story is that now I've actually been reconnecting with a lot of people I went to elementary, middle, and high school with. And someone I went to elementary school with was like, Tiffany, I didn't know that your dad passed away. And then someone I went to high school with who I just reconnected with said, Tiffany, I didn't know about the car accident. So all the elementary school folks knew about the car accident. You know, and it's like, here are all these parts of the story that I didn't share because I felt shame about it. And so all of these people made assumptions about what happened, if it was from birth, who I am, what I can or can't do. And now I'm just like, here you go. Here's the whole platter. I think something really relatable there, Tiffany, for all of us to consider is covering. You know, the the ways in which we cover parts of our identity that are stigmatized or discriminated against, and for us to right own our own covering, right, and and to think about is it necessary for me to do that? And I think that in celebration of 32 years of the ADA legislation, we can appreciate that and it wasn't too long ago that people could be discriminated against because of their disability. So this is all fairly new, but for us to say, I think all of us can improve in our openness and our ownership of our origin story and to really celebrate and recognize that there's all kinds of people in our organizations, which is what makes them so dynamic. Yeah. And one of the things I think a lot about is just because I exist means that I have a gift to impart on the world. I feel like I say that a lot in my work. And part of that is the number of disabled folks or disabled people who come to me who say that they feel really hopeless in their job search process and other things like that. And it hurts my heart that so many of us feel devalued because of the way that our body and our mind works differently. And I think that the challenge for companies is how can you find what that gift is? And I'm not a super spiritual person, but I believe that like the universe put each one on this earth because we are supposed to exist the way that we are. And so as individual whole humans, how can we just fill that space that we're given? And how can other people embrace that as well, I guess? I think that the point that you're making about that individual experience and like, you know, the obviously I'm not disabled or the there's an accommodation for a certain type of disability, but perhaps not as thoughtful for uh, overarching disabilities. I'd love to get your thoughts on the curb cut effect that's attributed to the activism of the late Ed Roberts and how that relates to current day work environments. Yeah, I mean, so much of, you can call it inclusive design, accessible design, universal design, all of those words are are used. I attribute to the curb cut effect. And the curb cut effect, I, I think there was a saying out there, I, I included this in part of my series where someone said, uh, cut a curb or like pave a way onto the sidewalk and you pave a path for everyone. I didn't word that correctly, but I'll actually share something that happened to me while I was at Goldman. All of the analysts, when we started, had an ergonomic assessment done of our desk. And you could read between the lines and say, well, we want to make it more comfortable so you can work longer or whatever. But when the ergonomic specialist came to my desk, they saw that I couldn't use one of my arms and they asked me what additional accommodations I might need. Like, do I need a speech to text uh, type of software, like a little microphone thing? And 
Because everyone got the ergonomic assessment, I didn't feel like I was asking for special treatment. I didn't need that speech to text software, but the fact that there was someone who came by every person's desk space made me realize like all of us have things that all of us have access needs that we need to thrive in an environment. There's an article I came across that said most like requests for disability related accommodations seem inconvenient and impractical until they're done. Remote working is, is an example of one, right? So, so again, I think it's, you know, how can we take this curb cut effect into our workplaces? It's how can we give each person who is on your team what they need to thrive? And that may look different from one person to another. Absolutely. And that's just it, right? Because you, you're making an accommodation or you're changing a, in this case, a, a curb to make it more accessible for people with, wheelchairs, but that's also helpful for parents pushing strollers and workers lugging tools and people with their wheelie bags on their way to the airport, runners, skateboarders, right? Yeah, yeah. And you know, I I also want to share roller bags on the luggage did not exist until airports became wheelchair accessible. And yeah, so that's from that's from a piece that I saw from Liz Plank, who is an incredible ally to our community. She's a journalist. I even saw a roller bag recently when I was in the airport that had a, a baby seat that was a part of the bag. So this kid was sitting on the shelf of the luggage, <laughs> like with with the with the seatbelt on, that cracked me up. So a quote that I've heard you share is this one by Francis Weller, and I'd love to get your thoughts on what this speaks to you, Tiffany. The quote goes, the work of the mature person is to carry grief in one hand and gratitude in the other and to be stretched large by them. How much sorrow can I hold? That's how much gratitude I can give. If I carry only grief, I'll bend toward cynicism and despair. If I have only gratitude, I'll become saccharine and won't develop much compassion for other people's suffering. Grief keeps the heart fluid and soft which helps us make compassion possible. What does that speak to you, Tiffany? Mm, I love that quote. I think it comes back to how I opened this conversation around those multiple layers of grief. And I, I often call childhood Tiffany, I call her nine-year-old Tiffany. I look at the tremendous amount of grief that she went through. And for a long period of time, I thought that that was the only place that she could sit. And I came across this quote actually during the pandemic, and it's something I bring up a lot, not only in my work, but to other disabled folks who are sitting in their grief. And I tell them, and I, that quote is a reminder to me too, that if I can sit in the depths of my grief and my despair, then imagine what the capacity I have is for joy and gratitude and the other side of that. Yes, oh, so beautiful. So let's close with one of your life philosophies, the PFJ philosophy. PFJ. Um, so this, again, ties back to nine-year-old Tiffany. And I honestly feel like after the car accident, I became 33-year-old Tiffany. I couldn't, I couldn't be a kid. And so PFJ stands for Play Fun Joy. And it's something that I just want to remind myself that, again, back to that Francis Weller quote, like when things are really hard, things can also be soft and easy and fluffy and fun. <laughs> um, so a lot of my philosophy these days is how can I inject more fun and joy and play into everything that we do? Uh, and, and it's funny, my... Uh, we have a team of eight at Diversability, and a, a large part of what we do is creating content now that we're in a virtual world. And our team just, the design process of putting a piece of content together isn't isn't that exciting. And every single time I, I remind them, I'm like, let's just have fun with it. Like, let's have fun with this design process. Like, let's remind ourselves that, like, we can have fun um, and uh, and the PFJ, it also ties in with one other thing, which is uh, on my headline on Instagram, I say, exploring what it means to be disabled and live well. And I spent a long time growing up thinking that those were mutually exclusive. I spent a long time growing up thinking that 
play fun joy was not something I had access to because of what I had been through. And we can sit in that contradiction. You know, that Francis Weller quote is it. You know, I, all of this ties back. Yeah, it like we can be the whole spectrum. Yes, yes. And like the bringing that all together, that's like the complexity and the the beauty of life is just having all of this together. It's not one or the other. It's not if then, it's more like yes and, right? How do we combine all of these life experiences into something that is relatable, shareable, that's something to celebrate? Um, so thank you for being a light, really. You are a light, Tiffany. And for bringing your life story to us in a way that enables us to see that duality and that complexity in life in, in a new way. Mm. Can I share one last thing? Yes, So something that just came up for me is if you are going through a hard time and sitting in your grief, I just want you to know that that isn't your story. Your story's not, that that isn't the the end point. It's still still going. So uh, just from, yeah, I think it's just like, we spend most of our time in these in-between moments. And so I just want people not to forget that if you, yeah, if you're going through a hard time right now, just know that you have the capacity to be on the extreme of that other side, which is amazing. Um, but part of how we know how that other side is as amazing as it is, is because you're in that dark moment right Thank now. Thank you. Thank you for that, Tiffany. Where can people find you? Yeah. And, and I also want to say, if you're not on TikTok, you can also access the Allyship series on YouTube and on Instagram. And the reason why I want to bring that up is TikTok is actually where I go for PFJ, for my Play Fun Joy. So in addition to the Allyship series, you will see a lot of other content on there. That's just me having fun, like travels I went on and I talk about my dating life. So that content might not be that interesting to you. So I just wanted to direct people to other places if if they only wanted the allyship series. Um, But if you want to follow me, I'm at I'm Tiffany Yu across social media. That's the letter I, the letter M, followed by my first and last name. And then if you're interested in following Diversibility's work, uh, part of our work at Diversibility is really about sharing the diversity of the disability experience, not just Tiffany's experience. You can follow us at Diversibility across social media. Thank you, Tiffany. And keep increasing intersectional disability representation and being the light that you are. Thank you so much. ROG Takeaway Tip how to apply what we've learned to our own work and lives. There are so many ideas and thoughts Tiffany shared with us to help us be better. Here are two things we can do to model more inclusive and generous leadership. Number one, coach everyone on the importance of language. When interviewing and onboarding everyone, ask quality questions like, what accessibility needs do you have to thrive in this environment? Let the candidate tell you and show you what they can do. Don't make assumptions or disqualify anyone from a role or additional responsibilities. Like Tiffany shared, approach every person you meet with curiosity. Curiosity leads to intimacy and connection, which leads to trust and generous leadership. I also love the idea of having an ergonomic assessment done for every employee. Number two, start or support an ERG, Employee Resource Group. Do you already have a group for people with disabilities to join in your workplace? It may be called Disability Interest Forum or Disability Employee Resource Group. Create your own internally and also leverage the brilliant thought leadership from Tiffany and her team at Diversability. Their content and resources are incredibly valuable and they're so warm and welcoming. So this week, coach others on quality questions and inclusive language to ensure that your talent has the accommodations they need to thrive and find out about and participate in employee resource groups for disabled employees and seek support from diversability. Join us next week with Fred Moss. Until then, stay generous, everyone. Thanks for listening to ROG, Return on Generosity podcast. Please help us grow by subscribing and reviewing us on your favorite podcast player. And for more information, visit bridgebetween.com. 
We grow when we give. 우리는 나누면서 성숙합니다. We grow when we give. 우리는 나누면서 성숙합니다. We grow when we give. We grow when we give.